Hello, in this video lecture, we're going to discuss distribution, uh, part of the marketing mix, uh, also known as marketing channels. Uh, a marketing channel is a set of interdependent organizations usually involved in the process of making a product or service available uh, for use uh, or consumption by the consumer or business user. Basically, how do we get our product from wherever we make it to the people who are going to ultimately use it. So, um, and this is uh, really important in that uh, it, it very, you know, it's it distribution is not the sexiest part of the marketing mix. You know, usually that's reserved for advertising or public relations or sales, but uh, distribution is extraordinarily important. Um, you know, not they don't they don't make movies about it, uh, or, but. Uh, without distribution, you're not really going anywhere. Um, and also the your channel choices in terms of distribution affect other decisions that you're going to make in the marketing mix, uh, such as pricing or marketing communications. For instance, if you're going to distribute through Walmart, your prices have to be lower. If you're if you're going to distribute through Nordstrom's, uh, your prices will have to be on the higher side. It also affects your, you know, your communications, your promotion, um, you know, how you promote it and where you send uh, customers to, uh, to find the product, which, you know, which channels to uh, send them to. Uh, and a strong distribution system can be a, a great competitive advantage. In fact, that's why a lot of, a uh, lot of time is put into uh, finding a strong distribution system. Uh, and it also involves long-term commitments to other firms, uh, you know, specifically distributors, retailers, wholesalers, and so forth. Uh, you don't change these relationships, uh, these you know, contractual agreements very, very quickly. Uh, you wanna find the right uh, distributor and then you wanna stick with them if you can, um, preferably. Uh, you know, switching, uh, switching them, switching a distribution channel is actually a very big decision, a much bigger decision than changing an advertising campaign, for instance, uh, because they are long term relationships. And uh, it's kind of like a marriage, you know, you, you, you're building a relationship, there has to be trust, um, has to be maintained. And if you get a divorce, uh, it's hard to go back, you know, also, you don't want to be seen as a company that will, uh, jump in and out of relationships, you know, distribution relationships. So, uh, you know, if you get a new new marketing director come in, come in who wants to make their mark, they're probably not going to touch distribution. They'll probably play with advertising, maybe a little bit with pricing, but mostly um, they're going to leave distribution alone. So it is the most difficult part of the marketing mix to change. Um, Part of the importance of, of distribution me channel members uh, is that uh, they are in direct contact with consumers. They will know what your consumer, what your custom, what your consumer preferences are, um, probably better than you are. So you probably want to listen to them very carefully. Um, they will know their customers' needs and uh, and wants and preferences. Um, they can guide customers towards or away from certain brands. Uh, giving a personal example, uh, years ago, I needed to uh, seal my driveway, and I knew nothing about sealing a driveway. So I went to Home Depot, and uh, I looked for uh, products uh, that might do that, and I, I, I was clueless. So I asked one of those uh, nice people in the, in the uh, orange aprons, and, and somebody said, oh, sure, so you come over here, we'll show you, and and. And interesting, uh, this person asked me an unusual question, a question I didn't expect. He said, will you be moving in the next couple of years? Are you going to stay in this house or are you going to move away? And I said, well, no, I think we're going to stay. He said, okay, fine. And I said, why, why did you ask? Well, if you were moving, uh, then I would recommend this particular product. It's, it's the least expensive. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's okay, but it's not a long-term product. You, know, you just might want to use it to, uh, basically it was, you know, the, the inexpensive product, uh, and not of as high, high a quality. 
Um, then he showed me another product that says, this is the best we have. It's the finest product. Uh, it's the same sort of uh, material that they use on racetracks and uh, runways at airports. It is a fine, very fine product. It's durable. It'll last a long time. Uh, it was also very expensive. So he said, but we also have this and this, uh, this, I, I think of it as the Goldilocks product. It wasn't too expensive, wasn't too cheap, wasn't too high quality, but it wasn't low quality either. And uh, this was the product that he recommended. So you actually have retail salespeople pushing you to or away from certain brands. So if you're a manufacturer, you want to be on good terms with the, the retailer and, and try to maybe influence those uh, retail uh, salespeople or clerks to push your product. Um, and so that's that's very important as well. Um, accordingly, you need to ev uh, evaluate channel members. Uh, again, it's a, like it's a long term commitment, like getting married. Um, so, you know, what do you look for in a partner? Uh, well, obviously, they need to be uh, the type of distributor that sells your product. Hopefully, they sell it to the target market that you have already established uh, that you want to reach out to. Um, what other things would you be interested in? Well, do they have integrity? Do they do what they say they're going to do? Are they honest? Uh, that's important. Uh I worked for a company that, that dealt with a distributor that turned out not to be honest. They actually ended up selling counterfeit product of our counterfeit product that was made, uh, basically counterfeited our product. Uh, we cut them loose as soon as we found that out. Um, but also, you know, for instance, are they, uh, are they, you know, financially solvent? You know, uh, you really don't want to use a distributor that's on the verge of bankruptcy because when they, they go bankrupt, you may they may have your product and you may not be able to get paid for it. So that's that's a problem. Um, and, you know, uh, you also want to find a distributor that will work with you, that will uh, you know push your product uh, over, uh, you know, uh, competitors or at least give you a fair chance not put your your product in the back, you know. Uh, so ultimately you will evaluate them and then make a selection of which distributors you want to distribute your product through. And once you've done that, then you then the more work comes and that's you have to manage and motivate these channel members, these distributors. Um, you you know what what do you have to motivate them for? Well, you want them to push your product, you want them to position, your product a well, let's say in a store, uh, even if it's in a website, you want it to pop up uh, nice, you know, often on, on when people come to visit the website, you want, you want prime positioning in, within the store, whether it's a virtual store or a, a brick and mortar store. Um, you know, you might want to uh, spend time training their sales reps uh, to, so they understand the product better. I, Years ago, uh, my wife and I, we had to uh, uh, completely gut uh, one of the bathrooms in our house. It was in a bad shape. We couldn't believe what the, the previous owners had done. Uh, and we went to a store, uh, you know, a, a dealership that sold Corian products. Corian is a product from DuPont. And uh, I was amazed at how knowledgeable the sales rep in the store was. Uh, and I said, how do you know so much about this product? You know, uh, and uh, Corian is actually a plastic, but it is so dense. It's it seems closer to marble or a stone type of product. Uh, and he, he he said, well, uh, I went to Corian school. DuPont actually, you know, gave him a two day training course in their product. So uh, he was, you know, quite he was quite motivated to uh, to promote that product accordingly. Uh, channel members do add value um, in a number of ways. Obviously, the, the most obvious thing is physical distribution, and that includes, of course, uh, uh, you know, um, warehousing and uh, shipping and, and a place to you know sell where you know consumers can come to. Um, you know, so and all and also uh, 
for some products, special storage is particularly important. Well, what do we mean by special storage? Well, it might be refrigeration. It might be freezing. It might be humidity control. For instance, cigars have to have a certain humidity level. They don't want to be too dry. You don't want to have them too dry. And you don't want to have them too moist. You know, And a lot of products have humidity issues. For instance, if you also also if you go into a restaurant that sells uh, lobster, uh, and you'll see those lobster tanks, um, that's a special storage situation. Actually, uh, a restaurant that sells live lobsters uh, has to maintain a, a animal handling license, which seems crazy since their ultimate destiny is to kill them. But they have to keep them alive and healthy until they actually decide to kill them. Um, so. That's the value they provide. Uh, distrib distributors also provide information. Uh, they gather information on consumers' uh, demands and tastes and preferences. Um, also, they can gather information on uh, competitors. So, uh, you know, what are competitors doing and what, what new products are they, are they coming out with? Uh, so and when we talked about competitive intelligence, uh, you know, that was part of that. Um, also, hopefully they will pr promote your product. Uh, they will advertise it. They will uh, sell it uh, actively, maybe run sales promotions, you know, discounts, specials, that type of thing on your product. And you certainly want to encourage them to do so. Um, you want to get this goes back to motivating uh, distributors. Uh, you might do that a number of ways. One is maybe offer the, them exclusive distribution rights to your product. That may not all be, always be possible. Uh, supplying them with in-store point of purchase uh, displays. Uh, sometimes even supplying them with shelving because there is a fight uh, in brick and mortar stores for shelf space. You go to think of a supermarket. Uh, you want to have lots of shelf space, lots of what's called facings. You know, that's where you have uh, different, let's say, take example, Cheerios. Uh, why does Cheerios have so many different versions, so many different line extensions? You know, they have regular Cheerios, whole wheat Cheerios, cinnamon, cinnamon Cheerios, uh, other types of Cheerios. Because they, because they have different versions of the product, they can get more space on the shelf. Uh, so there are many, <clears throat> many ways, uh, many things you can do to try to motivate that. And particularly uh, trying to get them to promote uh, in their own uh, promote your product in their own uh, you know communications, uh, matching products with customers. I, I kind of talked about that with my Home Depot example. You know, trying to uh, make sure the customer gets the right product, um, so to make everyone happy. Uh, there are various. Uh, Marketing channel models. Uh, the first one would be the conventional channel, where we have a producer or manufacturer who sells to a wholesaler, who in the turn sells to uh, uh, sells to a retailer, who then in turn uh, sells to the end customer or consumer. And you know you're familiar with many of these. You know you go to a store. Well. That store may not have purchased directly from the producer, the, the manufacturer. Uh, they may have produced through a wholesaler. For instance, one of the most common examples of this would be food. Uh, for instance, in New Jersey, uh, one of the big uh, food wholesalers is Gargiulo Foods. And they will, uh, <clears throat> they have lots of warehouses, lots of trucks. They handle logistics and they will gather up the different types of food, produce and meat and other types of uh, foods, and then distribute them uh, to various uh, smaller markets or uh, uh, sort of marketplaces, stores, that sort of thing. And then the consumer walks in. And this is sort of the conventional, traditional type of um, distribution channel. We also have direct marketing channels um, where the producer sells directly to the end user, the end consumer. Um, and, and these have been around for a long time. Think of like a bakery, you know, uh, in the bakery, they, they bake up the cakes and the rolls and the donuts and, and customers come in and, and buy uh, directly from them. But also 
uh, once the internet was introduced, that enabled a lot of companies which may have previously sold through traditional or conventional uh, distribution channels, now they can sell direct to the consumer. Uh, and you'll find that actually many companies will use multiple channels. Uh, so, uh, In addition, we have something called uh, vertical marketing systems or VMS. And this is where the producer of the product uh, manages or is, is much more integrated with the distribution in terms of wholesaling and, and retailing. And they ultimately send, uh, you know, get their product to the consumer. And there's actually various versions of this. So, so for instance, there is what's known as corporate VMS. And uh, some examples of that. Um, well, one in particular would be, uh, well, well, what first one would be, let's say, Luxottica. Luxottica is a company that makes eyeglasses um, and sunglasses, and they uh, they actually sell or produce almost about half of the world's uh, glasses. Uh, you you may have heard of the Luxottica brand, but also they have various distribution channels, such as Lens Crafters, where you can buy prescription eyeglasses. Uh, you know, they actually will have optometrists, um, uh, you know, on staff to measure your, you know, your eyes and uh, prescribe your glasses and uh, lens crafters will then make them up. Also, they have sunglasses, sunglass hut uh, for sunglasses. Uh, more recently, they purchased um, uh, the Ray-Ban brand, which was an older brand that had kind of... Uh, you know, they were particularly known for their aviator glasses. And uh, that was a brand that kind of went downhill over the years. And Luxottica bought it up at a, you know, at a pretty good price, took it off the market for a couple of years, and then reintroduced it as a premium brand. Uh, the people at Luxottica are uh, extraordinary marketers. Uh, another great example, uh, see here, Valero. Uh, Valero is an oil company. They uh, explore. They drill for the oil, they pump the oil, they'll uh, ship the oil to their refinery, and there they will refine it into gasoline and then uh, ship it uh, to uh, the Valero gas stations. They have completely integrated the, the, the production and distribution uh, of uh, oil and gasoline. Uh, you may yourself have uh, gotten gasoline at a Valero station. Uh, so that's actually, Valero is an excellent example of vertical integration. Uh, we also have contractual VMS. Um, and for the most part, we're talking about franchises, you know, and you're familiar with many, many of the franchises. Probably uh, one of the most common is uh, the most, one of the most famous is McDonald's. If you walk into a McDonald's, any, uh, you, any given McDonald's, you have a uh, only a one in three chance of actually being in a McDonald's that's owned by the McDonald's Hamburger Corporation. Two out of three are actually franchises. And uh, <clears throat> the way that works is the franchisor, in this case, McDonald's, uh, entertains an offer from a franchisee, somebody who has purchased land and would like to open up a rest McDonald's restaurant. Uh, and McDonald's will sort of look at them and evaluate them like they might evaluate a distributor. And <clears throat> there's an upfront fee. There is uh, uh, then the franchisee has to agree to follow the McDonald's model. Uh, they want to get use of they want to get use of the branding that has uh, made McDonald's very successful. So they will, you have to build your restaurant according to the McDonald's specs. Uh, you have to use their equipment. You have to use their ingredients. You know, the special sauce, the patties, the buns, or, or you know, the, the McNuggets, all that other stuff. Uh, and you then have to, you have to buy it from them. And then you also, I think, have to give a, a percentage of the proceeds to uh, McDonald's. And you, and you must follow the McDonald's model. You cannot, for instance... Uh, add things to the menu that are not McDonald's. For instance, even if you're in a, your local area, you discover there's a huge demand for sushi, you can't do McSushi because that's not part of the McDonald's brand. Uh, 
Subway, Hertz, uh, Holiday Inn, Ramon, and these are uh, other companies that will actually license out their brand. Uh, they also, of course, pay close attention. They want to make sure that these these franchisees are maintaining the quality. And and the strongest franchises are the ones that have tighter control. Um, it's a matter of quality, quality control. We also have uh, administered VMS. Uh, and this is where it's, it's uh, neither corporate nor contractual. Uh, it's the, you know, it's where one member of the, the channel has a lot of power. For instance, it might be manufacturer led like Procter and Gamble, very powerful brand, I'm uh, sorry, very powerful company that has many, many brands, uh, General Electric, uh, but another one would be Kraft. Uh, because uh, let's say a supermarket needs so many Procter and Gamble products or Kraft products, they're going to do what Procter and Gamble and Kraft want. Uh, uh, others are uh, led by the retailer. Um, probably most powerful is Walmart. Uh, Walmart tells the manufacturers how they want it, they, what size boxes they should be in, and what uh, what size pallets uh, their boxes should be on. And uh, <clears throat> Walmart is actually very good at uh, handling logistics. They they for instance they make sure that a truck has as little air in it as possible, that it's filled with product. So for that gas, the, the tank of gas that they're expending, uh, they're getting the maximum amount of product to the location that they're shipping to. Uh, and, and a lot of other things as well. A lot of other, uh, you know, uh, refinements to the distribution system. And Home Depot in a similar way, you know, will tell, uh, you know, product manufacturers how they want their product to fit in their store. Uh, Barnes and Noble, they, they'll, you know, they dictate the, well, at this point, there is, the industry pretty much has standard book sizes, so it's okay, but they want the books to fit their, fit their shelves. Uh, so, uh, a big part of uh, distribution, of course, is the, uh, the ordering cycle and uh, anyone who's having to main inventory. So let's say I'm, I'm starting a, a store. Uh, first thing I need to do is order some inventory. So I, I order it. It arrives uh, at a certain time. And as I open up shop and start to sell, uh, my inventory will be drawn down as, as I sell more and more product. And then, of course, I have to order again. But I, I don't want to wait to the last minute. So I've got to figure out how long I, I can wait before I can order. How long? How far ahead do I need to order? It might be a couple of weeks, it might be a couple of days, but you have to figure that out. And you order as as your as your inventory is declining, you predict when you're going to run out and make sure a new shipment comes in. You probably don't wait to wait to the last minute, but there you go. And this this repeats uh you know over and over again. And this is called the sawtooth pattern. Um and a certain amount of analysis will go into figuring out. Is it better to order large amounts of product uh, and order infrequently, or is it better to uh, order smaller amounts of product but order more frequently? Uh, and again, this is an uh, this is a, a you know, mathematical analysis that uh, people will do. I'm not going to cover that right now, but uh, you, know, you want to think about that. And in fact, many cases uh, you will. Uh, companies are trying to automate this uh, ordering process because they don't want somebody making a mistake and being out of product. So, uh, I want to give you a uh, particular example uh, on, on a bit larger scale. Uh, Procter & Gamble uh, has many brands and one of them you may be familiar with, although probably not more re not particularly recently, and that would be Pampers. Pampers is a, a disposable diaper uh, and any of you who might be parents will be probably grateful for Pampers or at least one of its competitors. Somebody at Procter & Gamble probably looked down at their warehouse and started thinking that maybe this is an, not the most efficient way to do business. So um, they looked down at what was going on, that their, their uh, demand, demand for the product uh, was not even. 
you know, it, it uh, maybe one day they get a lot of orders. Another day they get very few orders. Um, you know, it's very erratic, but they still have to maintain a large warehouse. They have to maintain a staff, um, you know, a lot of forklifts, a lot of loading docks, that sort of thing. Uh, but if you think about it, um, something's wrong there because uh, it's not like there really is erratic demand. Uh, you know, if anyone who's uh, ever been a parent can tell you that uh, babies poop at a fairly regular rate, they don't save it up for a few days. Uh, if they do, it's there, there's a problem. Uh, and so uh, this person at Procter & Gamble look at well, what's going on at the retailer. And they, they jumped ahead and they uh, looked at what was going on and they had some variation, but not nearly what uh, Procter & Gamble was going through. Uh, so they, they looked at what was going on. Their parents, uh, the parents would come in and they uh, they would buy uh, a couple packages. Uh, they they want to have extra. You don't want to be caught short on having uh, diapers. Uh, but they just buy a couple at a time. Well, <clears throat> a lot of people, a lot of parents were buying a couple at a time, and then as they're again this, going back to the sawtooth pattern, as they they're. Uh, Inventory got low, the store would finally order. And then you multiply that and, you, and you know, they go to the wholesaler. And, and when they connected the uh, through the distribution channel, what they discovered is as, as they went further back towards the manufacturer, the variation would, would increase because not everyone was working together. They were waiting for their inventory to come down before they would request more. In fact, Procter & Gamble looked at their suppliers and discovered it was even worse for the suppliers. You know, really erratic, uh, uh, or at least maybe not erratic, but much more uh, um, varying uh, you know, in the demand for the pro for their product. Uh, the suppliers, by the way, you know, would be things who people who made, uh, made the, uh, the plastic, the, uh, the tape, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the the powder the material that absorbs all the urine, uh, so you know, and and this is actually very wasteful because yes, one day you're you're running hard to deliver all these orders, the next day uh, maybe not so many orders. So what they really wanted was to have a more stable demand. The question you know they they wanted a demand along the, with lower variation like at the retail level. But what was happening is that the uh, the variation was being amplified as it went further back uh, towards the manufacturer. So part of supply chain management is how to how to manage this uh, this phenomenon that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, and part of it has been helped with technology. Uh, when somebody buys a product, you know whatever whatever the product is, and uh, you take the product and uh, when you buy it it's uh, scanned, there's a barcode. And that information was basically initially there to just ring up the price instead of a, uh, a cashier punching in the price. And when I was a kid, before this technology was available, you'd actually see people punching in the price. In fact, I did the same thing when I, years later, when I worked in a shoe store, I would punch the price into the cashier, ca uh, cash register. Now, you have barcodes, you just scan it, and the, ca the cash register knows what the price is. <clears throat> it's actually, you know, it's, it's entered into a computer, so to reduce human error. But that information was also used for, was also used for inventory. So when inventory goes down, the manager can see, oh, we're getting low on this or low on that, or oh, we're getting low on Pampers, we better order some. What Procter & Gamble and other manufacturers have realized, if they can get access to that information, have it transmitted to them, they can actually predict when people are going to order and actually load up trucks to, to fill those orders even before they are, even before the retailer needs it and realizes they need it. Uh, you know, one, one of the problems with this variation is that sometimes you have to send trucks that are half empty. And that's a waste of gas. And that's a waste of the time 
of the truck driver. So uh, one way that you can actually make a more efficient operation is by having a more efficient distribution channel. Uh, and this is why there's been a huge increase in the demand for understanding of supply chain management. Uh, you know, trying to have trucks that are always full, uh, reducing the amount of warehousing you need, the amount of uh, labor you need, number of equipment. Um, so by, it's the variation that actually creates a lot of costs. Uh, so uh, some other channel issues. Uh, there are issues about exclusivity. Um, who, who gets to distribute a product? Uh, generally, distributors want to be the only ones. They want to be have exclusive arrangements, but they can't always. But that is uh, that is a way, for instance, particularly when you're launching a new product to get distribution is to offer exclusive uh, distribution uh, agreements. Uh, if you're looking for that, if you're looking for exclusive distribution, you want to you want to put that in the contract. You want to, you know, do that. Sometimes uh, exclusivity can't be maintained, especially as a brand expands. But you know, there you go. Uh, but there will often be territorial agreements. For instance, uh, going back to franchising, uh, let's say I want to open up a McDonald's. I want an assurance from McDonald's that they're not going to open up a McDonald's half a mile away. You know, pulling my customers uh, towards the other McDonald's. So there will be often territorial agreements. There's often uh, channel conflict, conflict between different channels. Uh, this was probably most prominent when the internet internet was first set up. Uh, and I remember um, the company I worked for, we were selling product through various retailers and we were examining the possibility of selling via internet, selling our products online. And uh, a lot of people were worried because I remember one marketing manager saying, yeah, we do that. But then our distributors, our uh, brick and mortar dist distributors are going to get upset at us. Because now we're competing directly with them instead of being a part, just a strictly a partner. We're now going to be part competitor. And uh, you so you have to manage that. And one one way to manage it is to, to actually make your online price a little higher than the uh, the brick and mortar price, um, but that's not always possible. Um, so internet distribution is a good example of where you can have a lot of conflict. Um, another example years ago, uh, Tupperware was sold uh, by individual sales reps, uh, usually uh, women uh, who would find uh, a customer and, uh, and that customer would host a, a Tupperware party. And the Tupperware party was became a sort of an iconic thing in uh, American culture. Uh, and in exchange for hosting a party and having all her friends come over, uh, the housewife would receive some free Tupperware. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, Tupperware started selling in the stores, which actually kind of drove the Tupperware ladies out of business. Um, and they were quite angry about it. A similar thing happened with uh, Avon. Avon was sold mainly door to door. Uh, and the Avon lady was actually uh, part of an advertising campaign. It was an iconic thing. Uh, you have you would know some you, women would know an Avon lady who to get their uh, cosmetics and other uh, types of products. Uh, and then Avon went retail as well. Um, and eventually, of course, they went online. So there's all these conflicts between the different channels and that, that have to be managed. Uh, one challenge also is matching your manufacturing to the consumption. How much should you produce? And there are different mathematical models for trying to answer that question as best as you can. Trying to predict demand is, of course, always difficult. So there's that. Uh, basically, you're you're dealing with production variation costs. You know, when you when you produce more or produce less, that each has a cost. Uh, storing product has a cost because you have to pay for the warehouse space. Either you own it or you're renting it, but it's still a cost. So uh, that's always a challenge. 
Uh, return policies. Many stores, as you know, uh, and, and websites have return policies. Uh, once you sell the product, it seems like you don't want to take, you wouldn't want to take it back. But why, why do so many stores take product back? Well, they take it back because they want the customer to feel comfortable buying a product from from you and one thing that makes people comfortable is being able to return it if it's not quite right um and i know of people who actually will buy more than they're actually going to keep you know let's say uh you know they uh, want to buy uh, something for a friend but or a family member and they might let's say sweaters uh they buy uh, uh, two sweaters instead of one to find out what color they like and then they return the one they don't um of course an infinite return policy becomes very problematic because people might return things uh, years later uh, or and then it has happened. Um, so usually there's a time limit. Often maybe it's restricted to uh, maybe you can restore it, for, uh, return it for store credit as opposed to a full refund. Uh, those are all things uh, that can happen. There is, of course, uh, people who kind of borrow things from stores uh i've heard stories of uh, prom dresses you know somebody uh, young lady buys a prom dress wears it to the prom and then afterwards returns it um which is not particularly ethical but that's that's a challenge and uh, and many stores have to work out what kind of return policies are they going to have another issue uh, of course is uh, physical transportation uh, and there are many ways to transport products. Uh, railroads, uh, which started in the uh, 1800s, uh, are still a very viable and uh, valuable transportation method. Railroads can transport products over long distances. Uh, and actually, and, and in very economical ways. Uh, the fuel economy in railroads is actually much better than for trucks because, and you wouldn't think so because they're bigger and heavier, but they all, on a, if you look at it, think about a railroad, there's not as much stopping and starting. Um, once you get a train going, it has a lot of momentum. Uh, you don't have potholes. Uh, and actually somebody told me that you, uh, a train, uh, a freight train can get five miles to the gallon, which is terrible mileage for a car, but fantastic mileage for a train. Uh, so it's uh, the one problem with that, of course, is that uh, most railroads don't, uh, most stores are not near a railroad station. Uh, so it's it's not a perfect system, but, but railroads, and, and it's interesting that many commuter lines become freight lines you know, in the middle of the night, they switch, uh, you know, since there's nobody commuting, or let's say from, let's say one o'clock to four o'clock in the morning, they'll actually send freight trains uh, through. Uh, so there's a lot of freight that moves through across the country. Uh, it's a, a 19th century technology, but it still works and uh, still, still going. We, of course, have water carriers, you know, boats uh, that will carry large uh, amounts of, of goods. Uh, you will, you know, perhaps see see them at uh, at ports where they have all these uh, containers stacked up, um, and they're also uh, very economical, although they are slow. They're much slower than railroads or you know trucks or anything like that. But uh, again, the economy uh, of them is is very good. Air carriers, on the other hand, are uh, very expensive. Uh, you can, but the, the advantages of them is that uh, you can move goods very quickly. For instance, you could get goods from the United States to Australia in 24 hours. Uh, it's a long flight. I've taken that flight, but uh, but considering how far you're going, that's that's kind of amazing. Um, so usually you are uh, looking for express shipments or shipping things of high value relative to their weight so you have to uh you know heavy things that don't have a lot of value per pound not a good choice for uh air carriers but there you go. of course uh nobody has an airport or a uh, a dock or a railroad station at their uh, con at a convenient location so 
almost everything needs to be transferred to trucks. Trucks go anywhere a road can go. And in fact, in some cases where roads aren't, uh, you can't go off road. You know, there can be some off-road uh, uh, deliveries. Uh, and to facilitate this, a lot of uh, intermodal containers or piggyback containers have been created where you actually have a container that can sit on a boat with a crane, they can pick it up and move it and drop it on the bot on top of a flatbed railroad car or on the back of a uh, uh, of a truck. Uh, so and this this is way this way you don't have to unpack uh, the goods, you know the the, the merchandise. Uh, and so and so a lot of people are uh, have been working on improving the transportation uh, of goods because that can save a lot of money. Imagine the cost of, emptying one of those containers. Uh, if you've ever been on Route 1 and 9 in New Jersey, uh, going north towards the Pulaski Skyway, if you look over to the side, you can see a lot of these types of uh, intermodal containers stacked up, ready to be filled, ready to be emptied. So uh, another form of transportation, you don't, you don't even think of it as transportation because it's stationary, but pipelines, uh, gas, water, uh, can all be transported via pipelines. If you expand your definition of a pipeline, you could include electricity. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. In addition, uh, we have the internet. Now, there is a uh, potential for confusion here. Uh, I've asked people occasionally, say, well, what, what can be distributed by the internet? And people say, oh, well, anything. You can just order anything on the internet. Well, you can order it on the internet, but what is actually delivered? What's transported through the internet? Well, it has to be something that can be digitized. So what sort of things can you buy and have delivered through the internet? Well, uh, again, it has to be something that's digitized. Well, it could be music, could be movies, could be books, um, could be software, anything that can be digitized. In fact, uh, many services, uh, you know, Zoom, uh, enabled a lot of people to deliver services online where they previously couldn't. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as to, you know, physical products, nah, not so much. However, there is a way there too. Uh, if you are familiar with 3D printing, uh, and a, th a basic 3D printer costs similar to what a paper printer would cost. Uh, now, there are more advanced printers, uh, 3D printers as well. But uh, what you now do, could do is sell the design. And, you know, you will down, people can pay for the design and download the design and then print it on a 3D printer. Uh, they do this with the space station. Um, if uh, people on the space station need a certain part or a certain tool, well, how do you get it up to the space station without launching another rocket? Well, you what they can do is transmit uh, uh, the design and they 3D print the tool or part or whatever they're doing in, in, uh, on board uh, the space station. Uh, I was actually, I used to teach at a university that actually had some very old buildings and uh, the maintenance department uh <clears throat> there, were, there were some really old windows and they had uh, these latches uh, that broke and they didn't they, they didn't make the latches anymore. So what somebody did is said, well, get good, get a good latch, take it off, we'll scan it, and then we'll 3D print a new latch to it. And uh, and the, the original latches were metal, the new ones they printed in plastic and occasionally they break, but then they just print a new one. Uh, that was that was actually a fairly creative solution to a problem. So uh, as 3D printing technology improves, you might see people just go shopping by you know, finding a design and downloading it. Future holds interesting things. Anyway, uh, obviously, I would expect that you'll have questions, uh, but obviously you can't do it through this video, but you can certainly email me with questions or save them for when we are uh, physically together. So, all right, take care.